For what they tell us about panthers is true of you and those like you, that they draw all other kinds of beasts to themselves with their aroma. We are, it is said, the aroma of life to some and the aroma of death to others. But to me, you are the aroma not of death, but of life. Thus wrote the distinguished Basel-based humanist and soon-to-be evangelical reformer Johannes Ukulompadius, he's the one on the right with the beard, in his first ever letter to his Zürich counterpart, Huldrich Zwingli, on the left without the beard. He wrote this on the 10th of December, 1522. Rhetorically, the passage is, of course, what's called a captatio benevolentiae, an attempt by Ukulompadius literally to capture the goodwill of to ingratiate himself with his, at that stage, better known Zürich contemporary. And the context of 1520s proto-Protestantism, shall we call it, it's hardly surprising that Ukulompadius should quote from the New Testament, here specifically from 2 Corinthians chapter 2. More striking, though, is his reference to panthers, whose aroma is so alluring as to attract all other kinds of beasts to themselves. Well, where does that at first extremely strange notion come from? The answer is, as it often is in uh, the Middle Ages, Pliny. The material comes at least indirectly from Pliny the Elder in his Naturalis Historia, Natural History, compiled mainly in the first, third quarter, sorry, of the first century AD. Ukleonpadius' information comes at least indirectly, as I say, from Pliny's Book 8, <coughs> where he states the following about panthers. They say that all quadrupeds are attracted in a most wonderful manner by their odor, while they are terrified by the fierceness of their aspect, for, its, for which reason it, the panther, conceals its head and then seizes upon the animals that are attracted to it by the sweetness of the odor. One wonders whether, for all the weirdness of this, some aspects of it at least might have been based on, sort of indirectly extrapolated from the actual observable hunting habits of the leopard. Because of course that's what the panther is. The panther is basically a leopard that carries a recessive gene for melanism and hence it's often, though not always, black. But certainly when panthers stroke leopards are hungry, Desmond Morris tells us, they hide in the undergrowth to ambush their victims they hide their faces and let animals come to them rather than actively pursuing their prey. So maybe there's an element of scientific observation lying somewhere between Pliny's otherwise obviously fanciful account of panther behavior. But I'm here to tell you that the zoological evidence for panthers emitting an overpoweringly beautiful smell is zero. <coughs> That then answers at least one of the questions posed by Ukulompadius' comparison to a panther. We know roughly where what you might call the pseudoscientific material comes from. But there are other questions that arise as well, aren't there? Not least, how could the panther be seen by people in the 1520s as a virtuous animal to which you would compare someone you wanted to flatter? I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be instinctively enthusiastic about being compared to a panther, or at least not to its odour. But it seems that Swingley was, given that he not only wrote back, but did so in the friendliest of terms. So why might he have been flattered by the panther comparison? Well, the reason for this is to be found ultimately in the physiologus, literally the naturalist, an immensely widely read collection of nature exempla that originated in Alexandria, in the second century AD, underwent numerous translations and adaptations, and then exerted a powerful influence on the way animals were perceived throughout and beyond the Middle Ages. The physiologist quite simply equates the panther with Christ. Go figure. All complete versions of it tell us that the panther has a, a beautiful multicolored coat and is by nature mild and merciful. When it has eaten its fill, the panther goes into its cave and sleeps for three days. On waking, it immediately gives a loud roar, and from its mouth there streams forth a wonderfully sweet perfume. Hence, 
when they hear the panther's voice, the other animals all rush towards it, with the exception, of course, of the dragon, which cannot endure the panther's aroma and hence stays put in its own cave. There then follows, in all the physiologous versions, what you'd call an allegorical interpretation, in which the panther's behavior is systematically compared to that of Christ. Possessed, like the panther, of a beautiful and virtuous nature, Christ also slept for three days before rising again to save mankind through the sweetness of his grace. All in all, then, the physiologist essentially does two things, I suppose, to Pliny's report on the panther. Obviously, it adds a, a Christian interpretation. It adds a layer of Christian allegory to the various aspects of the panther's supposed behavior. It reinterprets them in the light of Christian theology, and particularly the history of salvation. But the physicalist also um, amends the, you know, the original, what I called pseudo-scientific material itself in such a way as to make it more, a more appropriate vehicle for communicating a Christian message. It doesn't just interpret the material, it actually changes it. For example, mentions of the panther's fearsome head and aggressive intent have gone and are replaced by references to its beautiful coat and general benevolence towards all except the dragon. And it goes without saying that the additional detail of its sleep lasting three days creates a new and explicit link between the panther and Christ's death and resurrection. So from late antiquity right up until the 1520s, it probably seemed natural, indeed it might almost have seemed inevitable, to think of the panther in a positive light. Its close association with Christ persisted for centuries, and with time the animal took on a range of other, almost exclusively positive meanings. One might, for example, refer to the uh, so-called Reductorium Morale, which is a remarkable collection of nature exemplar compiled around 1290 by the Dominican Pierre Bersuire or Petrus Bercorius. This has the by now standard detailed allegory of the panther as Christ, but also offers additional elements. For example, interpreting the panther's roar upon waking to the voices of Christ's faithful preachers, and appending to the main series of chapters a set of alternative interpretations linking the panther to the Virgin Mary or with holy men. Elsewhere, the panther became an emblem of specific virtues, such as humility and largesse. For example, in the so-called Etymachia tradition, the standard versions of this work see the panther's breath as representing the attractive nature of humility, which draws people to itself and indeed endows them with other virtues, and a variant which finds its way into the Concordantia Caritatis of Ulrich von Lilienfeld equates the panther's sweet-smelling breath with almsgiving, and hence with the virtue of largetas, largesse. By the way, <coughs> question for you now. This is a, a manuscript of Ulrich von Lilienfeld's uh, Concordantia Caritatis, uh, now in Budapest, dating from 1413. So which of those two animals is the panther? Is it the one on the right or the one on the left? This is like the optician, isn't it? <laughs> is it the one on the right or the one on the left? Which is the panther? Who thinks it's the one on the right? <laughs> and who thinks it's the one on the left? Yeah, well, you're all wrong because that's the panther. <laughs> that is, of course, a highly equine panther. And that on the left is a pard, P-A-R-D. It's a, an animal that doesn't really exist, of course, but it was believed, along with the lioness, to be one of the adulterous, illegitimate parents of the leopard. So, Leopardus, you see. Anyway, <clears throat> you might need to get a new glasses prescription, but there are only a few of the very many examples that you could mention. I think we've had more than enough, though, to indicate that the panther generally meant, in the Middle Ages, almost exclusively good, indeed very good things and people. Christ, Our Lady, holy men, virtues, and so on. Now, in answering <coughs> some of the questions at least raised by the 16th century uh, um, citation from Ucalampadius we began with, in effect, we've already started to outline a history of the 
allegorical panther, if you like, in the Middle Ages, which is really largely, indeed almost exclusively, a history of the uses to which its iconic physiolo physiologous interpretation was put by Christian authors. And this allegorical history, though not necessarily its use by evangelical reformers like Ucolompadius and Singley, is already quite well documented, thanks to publications mainly by Germanists, such as Dietrich Schmidtke, Nikolaus Henkel, Stephanie Mühlenfeld, and indeed myself. This is true, by the way, also of numerous other animals. The medieval German association, med the medieval Christian associations, sorry, of several creatures have been recorded and analyzed, not only, but especially by German scholars, from Friedrich Ohli back in the 1950s, right down to the present. While such work as that, though, remains significant and distinguished, it doesn't give the whole story. Certainly, it responds effectively to at least one and sometimes dominant aspect of medieval thinking about animals. Namely, that in creating nature, God had created a kind of book in and from which human beings could learn a great deal about both himself, God, and themselves. And this view is presented, I'm tempted to say notoriously, but certainly lucidly, by Thomas of Chobham in an early 13th century work on the art of preaching. The Lord created different creatures with different natures, he says, not only for the sustenance of men, but also for their instruction, so that through the same creature we may contemplate not only what may be useful to the body, but also what may be useful in the soul. There is no creature in which we may not contemplate some property belonging to it which may lead us to imitate God or some property which may move us to flee from the devil. For the whole world is full of diverse creatures, like a manuscript full of different letters and sentences in which we can read whatever we ought to imitate or flee from. In the end, then, animals exist to serve mankind's physical needs and, in a sense, also his spiritual needs. And they fulfill the latter task, not least in becoming the subject of allegorical interpretations of the kind we've already observed in the case of the panther. This very anthropocentric view of the book of nature, though, isn't actually the only way animals were used and thought of in the Middle Ages. And hence the traditional scholarly focus on it, on the book of nature, if you like, can only ever be partially successful. More specifically, the allegorical approach to the study of an animal uh, that we've been using so far has well, obvious strengths, but also has several limitations. I pointed to three limitations here. First of all, all too obviously, what we've talked about so far actually has very little to do with real animals, doesn't it? Uh, with the natural history here of panthers who have actually lived and died, whether in the Middle Ages or in any other period. We've shown very little concern, in other words, for zoological accuracy. Secondly, up to now, we've been lumping all panthers together. We've been speaking of the panther rather than individual ones or a group of them. We've not yet made any attempt to consider panthers as individuals, but only as generic exemplars, if you like. And thirdly, in what we've talking about, uh, been talking about so far, I think you could say our focus hasn't really been on the panther at all, has it? It's been on God and human beings. We've been looking at exemplary behavior and what that might mean for the context of human society, of people's relationships with each other and with God. So I think you could say that the kind of thinking we've been engaging in so far is really looking beyond panthers or even looking through them, trying to work out what they might teach us, rather than looking at them and their own lives as a legitimate focus of interest. So those are you know, three limitations with the kind of work I've often done in the past and a lot of other people have done in the past. If we are adequately to understand the medieval panther or indeed any other animal, we certainly do need to consider the spiritual interpretations of genus-specific behavior that we've been talking about. Medieval authors were very fond of them. But I think we need to do a few other things as well. First of all, we do have to engage 
in a modicum of medieval zoology, trying to work out what medieval people did think the species in question actually was and how they thought it behaved in real life. Secondly, we should follow the lead of uh, scholars associated in recent years with uh, the interdisciplinary agenda called animal studies, who have focused on encounters between human beings and individual animals, especially on those interactions which question or challenge the traditionally understood anthropological difference between humans and other mammals. And thirdly, we should now follow also the impetus of a, a new generation, a young generation of German colleagues, such as Jan Gluck and Marion Dachliek, who have foregrounded in particular the idea of agency, the agency of animals, particularly, though not exclusively, as this appears in narrative literature. Considering, in other words, ways in which individual animal agents, not in spite of, but specifically because of their intrinsic animality, can shape and influence events, themes and ideas in literary worlds created by committed and attentive human agents. So in the light of all that general stuff, I'm going to attempt to give at least some preliminary responses to three key questions concerning the panther, all of which I think do need to be answered if we're to come to an adequate understanding of its pre-modern cultural history. First, what did medieval people know about panthers, quite simply? Secondly, are there any, literal, li any literary examples of panthers playing a role in medieval literature that, as it were, goes beyond agency, and, but beyond allegory and towards agency? And thirdly, are there any encounters between a panther and a human that challenge or subvert orthodox perceptions of a clearly defined anthropological difference? between humans and animals. Uh, in addressing these questions, I think it'll be helpful if I, from time to time at least, refer to some parallels from the 19th and 20th centuries also, that illuminate how certain trends that were nascent in the Middle Ages acquired greater levels of clarity and or complexity as they developed within later cultural contexts. And in addressing these questions also, I hope that we'll be able at least to point towards a methodology that for all the invariable caveats and variables might potentially be used for transferable onto writing the cultural history of other species as well. So that's the agenda. But the first question is, what did medieval people really know about panthers? The answer is actually quite easy, not much. <laughs> Certainly, there are not many written or pictorial sources from the Middle Ages which suggests that people knew even what kind of animal the panther was. Neither Isidore of Seville from circa 600 or Albertus Magnus from circa 1260, two of the principal natural historians, if you like, of the Middle Ages, seem to have had any clear notion that the panther is actually a feline, a big cat. Doesn't seem to have been known to them. Uh, Isidore, this is a chapter from his Etymologies, says, the panther is so called because it is a friend of all animals except the dragon and because it rejoices in the society of its own kind and gives back whatever it receives in the same kind. For in Greek, pan means all. This beast is ornamented with tiny round spots in such a way that it is marked with little round eyes varying black and white against a tawny background. Well, I suppose maybe there's a sort of shadowy outline description of a leopard lurking there somewhere in the background, isn't there? But it is in the background. Isidore says nothing at all about what size or type of spotted animal the panther is, because he's more interested in the end in the etymology of the animal's name than in its natural characteristics. His interpretation of pantera is that it's panteras, all beasts. That's what he understands panther as meaning, and that is an interpretation that was to prove very influential, leading some authors and illustrators, for example, to think that the panther's appearance contained a small amount of either all colors in the world or indeed of all species in the world. And you may have seen before this panther from the 13th century uh, bestiary manuscript known as Bodleian, the Bodleian 764, 
where the panther is as genuinely multicolored as any animal could get. Panteras. And this general ignorance of what panthers were really like seems to have persisted actually pretty much through the Middle Ages. Even Albertus Magnus, in many ways the most progressive, I suppose, medieval natural historian, is very sketchy on the panther. The panther, he says, is an animal that is entirely adorned with various colors. Its spottedness is in the form of eye-shaped circles on a tawny background, edged sometimes in white, sometimes in blue. Due to the heat of its hunger, this animal, as do the other sharp-clawed animals, often overeats. At this time, it takes itself to its cave and sleeps for a long time. When it awakens, a fine-smelling vapor emits from it, and according to Pliny, other animals follow it in herds. But this is false, or rather, we know this to be false, said hoc falsum esse schemus. For no other animals apart from the human either take joy in or are saddened by smell. It's not true, actually, is it? But all the same. It's a vocal animal, he says of the panther, giving frequent calls in its desire for intercourse. At this, some animals of its own or of a related genus flock to it. Well, that's a very interesting mixture, isn't it? Very interesting mixture. Um, he's obviously taken a good deal from Pliny, much of it uncritically, like the familiar material about the panther's colorfulness and spottedness. Elsewhere, he has tried to rationalize in what we might now see as a forward-looking way, tried to rationalize some key elements of the physiologous story. For him, it's just inconceivable that one animal could attract another animal by dint of its smell. Hence, if other animals are attracted into the panther's presence, it must be because the panther has got a very, am very animated and very loud mating call. And if the panther betakes itself to its cave in the first place, the only reason for this can be that it's overeaten and needs a postprandial nap. <clears throat> so Albert does make some attempt to make his material on the panther more logical and plausible, but for all this there isn't really very much to suggest that he knew much about real panthers, or indeed that he would have recognized one if he'd met it on the streets of Cologne. And in this, of course, he's entirely typical of uh, medieval authors and indeed illustrators. And you can see this uh, throughout any number of bestiary manuscripts, like this one. That panther is, is eerily a lookalike of Vladimir Putin, isn't it? So it's, really, it's really, really quite sort of disturbing. That's the, that, so that Putinesque panther, panther is from Paris, Bibliothèque Nationale, uh, 4112, so 1285. So he's a panther. This is also a panther with spectacular horns. You can see the blue and white elements coming in there. That's from Amsterdam, from the Royal Library in Amsterdam, circa 1350. Or this one also, very well known one from the Aberdeen Bestiary, manuscript 24, um, circa 1200, where the, the panther and the sort of the cowering, very snake-like dragon are kind of color coordinated, aren't they? Uh, but again, blue to the fore. Or there's this one, top left-hand corner, from the 14th century Fürstenfeld bestiary, now in Munich, which to me clearly shows the influence of um, heraldic panthers. The very un-panther-like design then in vogue in heraldry, where a panther had a horse's head, eagle's claws, goat's feet, and lion's tail. So, like that one. You see where he got it from, I think. Literally incredible panthers such as these are, as I say, entirely typical of high and late medieval bestiaries. Uh, in, a, uh, in fact, in only one of the 51 panther illustrations found on the website bestiary, uh, uh, what's it called, bestiary.ca, it's a Canadian thing, um, got all the bestiary illustrations on there, only one of 51 panther illustrations clearly shows the animal as a big cat. And, and the body shape there, it's more like a cheetah, actually, isn't it? But all the same, it is clearly a large feline. Interesting, that's a late northern Italian manuscript, the so-called Sloan Bestiary, from around 1440. And no doubt an illustrator at such a place, at such a time, is rather more likely to have known roughly what a panther was than someone working in, say, 13th century France 
or England because there were several menageries containing wild cats in northern Italy and on balance artists were probably likelier to have encountered traces of classical and ancient traditions where panthers were a little bit better known like on this mosaic from I think it's the fourth century you now in New York where you have what I think are fairly clearly two female panthers and they're obviously pantheresses aren't they and because of their body shape and dark coloring they seem to me to be panthers rather than leopards but with only a few exceptions knowledge of panthers in the middle ages could euphemistically be described as imperfect and in the light of this it's hardly surprising that also in medieval narrative literature such panthers as appear tend either to display very few species specific characteristics or to derive these exclusively from the familiar motifs of the physiologist tradition. In stories set in the Orient, for example, undifferentiated and undescribed panthers are simply given from ruler to ruler in the interest of gaining prestige or influence. You know, X gave Y 20 camels and 10 panthers, that kind of thing. There are also several mentions of panther skins, which were seen as desirable because they denoted a certain exotic wealth, but also because they could in bizarre ways be practically useful. In the Nibelungenlied, for example, Siegfried seeks protection by donning a sweet smelling panther skin. Not of course that it saves him from being murdered by Hagen. In the 14th century Niederrheinischer Reisebericht, discussed by Stephanie Mühlenfeld, panther skin is used to, to make a, a wonderfully aromatic bedside rug. And in some versions of Sir John Mandeville's travels, they're not panthers as far as I know, but they kind of could be, um, <coughs> the, the walls in the Great Khan's palace are adorned with panther skins, I quote, because they smell as good as anything can and because of their smell no bad air can come into the palace. Panther skins as industrial scale air fresheners. <laughs> a bizarre notion that reveals, a, 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 I suppose, a halfway explicable tendency, maybe, to transfer the aroma of the panther's breath onto its skin. Now, it would be idle to suggest that panther figures such as these possess any kind of personal, personal or individual agency, in the sense of being able independently to influence events and suggest themes. In other romances, though, something of the sort does occasionally occur. A good, though not, uh, not, not um, unique example from the German-speaking world, uh, specifically from Austria, is the early 14th century German adaptation by Heinrich von Neustadt of the legend of Apollonius of Tyre, Apollonius von Thurland. Some 10,000 lines into this convoluted and often eccentric adventure story, a panther appears called Ein Pantia, Das Pantia. The setting <coughs> is a kind of watering hole. Having overcome the fell assaults of a, a huge self-multiplying eel and a comparably blood-curdling super crab, Apollonius finds himself surrounded by various animals engaged in the act of drinking. When they've finished, a fearsome hullabaloo arises as the various species set about fighting each other, at which point a noble panther appears and the other animals follow the panther because its smell is so good that it pleases animals. In this instance though, those animals soon flee again because the panther is attacked by a pitch black fire spewing dragon who puts the panther in peril of its life until Apollonius courageously intervenes in its defense and kills the dragon. From this point on, knight and panther develop a close interactive relationship, which is clearly inspired in part, uh, for, for those who know it, on the relationship between the hero and the lion in Chrétien de Troyes' Yvain and Hartmann von Auer's Iwin. Already during the combat, the panther reciprocates Apollonius's aid when the knight is severely burned by the fire spewed from the dragon's mouth. He, this is Apollonius, was so greatly troubled by the fire that he nearly died. Then the noble panther came quickly towards him. It took water into its mouth 
and this rescued the knight. The panther blew the water onto him and put out the fire completely. But it goes on. Immediately afterwards, this useful, worthy panther turns from acting as a living and breathing fire extinguisher to serving temporarily as Apollonius's mount. The latter's horse has been ripped to shreds by the dragon, much to the knight's loudly expressed sorrow, and the panther responds to Apollonius's lament by offering itself as a replacement. No sooner had Apollonius finished this speech than he saw the panther before him. It lay down on the ground and gestured to the most noble man to sit on its back. Its behavior was tame. It crept towards him on all fours. After a brief pause, you know, reasonably enough to weigh his options, Apollonius decides that he will jump on the panther's back, and the latter then carries him for, you may already have guessed it, three days and three nights, until they reach the city of Nineveh. Moreover, once there, the level of communication between human and animal intensifies still further. The narrator says that the panther knelt down as if to say, here I must leave you, noble man. You should give me leave. Apollonius dismounted. The panther stood up and ran into the forest. Interesting communication mechanisms, aren't they? The panther makes a gesture that signifies to Apollonius what it wants. Apollonius responds silently, but appropriately. And the narrator proceeds to verbalize the meaning of the panther's gestures. As it were, he translates the animal's body language into words, signifying not that the panther is in any sense human, but that it can communicate as though it were human. Of course, it's not difficult to see echoes of the physiologous allegory in all that, is it? Indeed, you could interpret almost the whole episode between Apollonius and the panther as a kind of implicit allegory in which the panther can be seen as representing Christ. Think, for example, of the enmity with the, dra with the dragon, the motif of three days and three nights, even the decision to stop before the notoriously godless town of Nineveh. But there's more to it than that, because this panther does undeniably have a form of agency. It's individualized. It plays a significant independent role in furthering the narrative's plot, and it does this in ways that are intrinsically and essentially linked to its animality. Most obviously, perhaps, in its dog-like submissiveness and loyalty, and in its horse-like ability to be ridden by humans. Moreover, the panther is able to develop a functioning, mutually communicative, for a time decidedly close human-animal relationship with Apollonius. As I say, theirs is not a relationship that ch challenges the fundamental divide between man and beast, but Heinrich von Neustadt certainly does use this animal to suggest the possibility of a closer, more integrated relationship between human and animal, nature and culture, based on the abandonment of mutual fear and its replacement by mutual trust. Now, when it comes to ascribing agency to Apollonius's panther, there is, of course, a problem. I was going to call it the elephant in the room, but I thought we probably already had enough species confusion for one evening. Because, of course, let's face it, this panther isn't really a panther, is he? It is not unequivocally a panther at all. Heinrich von Neustadt obviously knows or thinks he knows that panthers are big enough to be ridden on by humans. The intertextual links with, uh, with the other texts I mentioned, with the, the pre presentation of the lion, um, suggest that he may also have been vaguely aware that panthers are felines. But that's as far as the animal's panthericity, if you like, really goes. There's no physical description of it. Its behavior is, as we've seen by turns, leonine, canine, and equine. Hence, to the modern reader at least, the agency of this animal is clearly that of an animal, but not as clearly that as a panther. And for that kind of agency, I think we have to wait a fairly long time right up, quite probably, to the publication of Rudyard Kipling's Jungle Book in 1894.
Because here we meet what I'm tempted to call a real fictional panther, Bagheera. Um, almost everything we need to know about Bagheera is communicated in, the first, in his first appearance. A black shadow dropped down into the circle. It was Bagheera the Black Panther, inky black all over, but with the panther markings showing up in certain lights, like the pattern of watered silk. Everybody knew Bagheera, and nobody cared to cross his path, for he was as cunning as Tabakwi, so uh, the, the, the jackal, as bold as the wild buffalo, and as reckless of the, uh, uh, as the wounded elephant. But he had a voice as soft as wild honey, dripping from a tree, and a skin softer than down. So that's a panther of a rather different kind from any we've met so far, isn't it? <clears throat> Sorry, just a moment. Um, he's an imposing animal, fearsome, but a kind of gentle giant as well. And in many ways, he comes across, I think, from the beginning as predestined in his panthericity for a role as lifesaver, friend, mentor, and father substitute for the human child, Mowgli. Throughout the Jungle Book, you could argue, Bagheera simply remains what he is. He hunts, kills, eats, scolds, teaches, loves, protects. And in the end, like, like actual panther parents, he also knows when to let go and allow Mowgli to return to human society. Even his last words in the second Jungle Book, go now and remember Bagheera loved you, are very humane, but in their way, also panther-like. Now, as I've already said, neither Heinrich von Neustadt's panther nor Kipling's, whilst sophisticated creatures capable of agency and friendship with humans, at any point threaten to become human themselves. They remain safely behind the dividing line between man and beast that we tend to call the anthropological difference. In answer to our third question today, though, as to whether there are any medieval literary panthers who do emphasize the porosity or fragility of such human-animal divides? The answer is, perhaps surprisingly, yes. I'm thinking here of the vernacular French uh, narrative poem, Le Dit de la Panthère d'Amour, composed by Nicole de Margival, probably in Picardy, around 1290. The poem begins <coughs> with Nicole's narrator stating that he was in bed on the eve of the Feast of the Assumption, when he dreamt of being transported by a bird to a forest full of many diverse animals, including climatically une bête. First of all, this animal is simply called a beast. But this bête is of indescribable beauty, not least because its coat has in it something of the color of every other animal, and all of these, save the dragon, want to approach it for love of its sweet breath, which is sweet, good, and healthy so much so that it can cure them of all their ills. Now by the time, but by this time, I suspect that many of Nicole's readers are concluding that the bet must actually be a panther. But if so, they're a step ahead of the narrator who has to await the arrival of the god Amor, Amours, to tell him what the signifiance of the panther actually is. It or rather she, because of course, in the Romance languages, panther, pantera is a feminine. So this is a pantheress. Um, she's a panther whose many colors reflect the abundance of virtues that dwell in her. And sorry, I'm turning now a bit belatedly to the screen. And her breath, which is sweet and good, which gives health to the sick, for which reason the animals follow after it, who sense its great sweetness, is signified by her words, which are neither foolish nor mad, but wise, temperate, and well governed by reason. That's the end of it when we say, qui ne sont ni nis ni folle, mais sage et bien entendre, that sort of thing. So we now know, and the narrator knows, what the panther means. And I'm tempted to say, so far, so good. Or at least, so far, so more or less physiologous like. Right? But a, a surprise is in store. Because as his dream continues, the narrator gradually becomes aware that slowly but inexorably, the panther's identity is becoming merged with or subsumed under that of his own human beloved. 
Eventually, indeed, in his present state of consciousness, he can no longer differentiate between the two of them, panther and lady. A process that's eventually capped by the panther making in the voice and using the words of the narrator's inamorata, the rather long-winded declaration of love that I put on the screen. I'll just read the culmination. So you do not need to be sorrowful because I grant myself and mercy to your will in all goodness and all honor without ill thought or dishonor, says a female panther to a male human. But don't worry, nothing dodgy happens. Um, this is a pre-watershed lecture after all. Because at the very moment that the possibility of interspecies intercourse is placed on the agenda, the narrator wakes up and the moment of human-animal assimilation has gone. The merging of human and animal identity that Nicole has sort of adumbrated proves to be only partial and implied, occurring as it has only in a dream which has no direct consequences for actual behavior even within the context of the narrative. Nevertheless, I think that's a strikingly ambitious literary experiment. It's a one-off, as far as I know, for the Middle Ages, um, and a pointer to what we now know to be the essential porosity of the animal-human divide. Again, to look at something that's worked through a bit more fully and a bit more challenging, challengingly, we have to look beyond the medieval period, most obviously, I think, to Ambrose Bierce. The eyes of the panther, it's a singular in, um, in, 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 in uh, sorry, it's singular in, in the German translation, but it's the eyes of the panther in the original American. First published in 1897. In this narrative too, the reader gradually becomes aware of an exceptionally close connection between the main female character, Irene Marlowe, and the panther. The first paragraph describes Irene as lithe, as dressed in a grey gown with odd brown markings in its texture, and above all dwells on her panther-like eyes, grey-green, long and narrow, with an expression defying analysis, the narrator says. Later on, she's described as possessing feline beauty, and we learn that her life has been defined by a traumatic incident in which her mother, when pregnant with her, was frightened almost to death by the appearance in their house of a panther staring at them with terrible eyes. So, in many ways, in Bierce's story, as in Nicole de Margival's, the reader gradually becomes persuaded that the panther and the woman have a largely shared identity, to the extent, indeed, that they are almost inextinguishable. And by the end of the story, in Bierce, that identification is tragically complete. When Irene's suitor, Jenner Brading, sees her eyes in the dark, he mistakes them for the eyes of a panther. And when finally, a few nights later, he shoots what again in the dark looks and sounds like a panther, he discovers that he has in fact shot Irene himself. Well, I suppose in many ways that's got more in common with a werewolf story, hasn't it, than with, than, than with anything we've seen from the Middle Ages. But all the same, it does kind of stand in the same tradition as Nicole de Margival of presenting situations in which human and panther natures become intermingled to the point of inseparability. In Nicole's case, fleetingly and harmlessly. In Beers's case, definitively and tragically. So we're almost at the end of our attempt to add a few more stones to the mosaic that is the cultural history of the medieval panther. I hope I've begun to show that any satisfactory attempt at such a history must take account of the allegorical panther, the real panther, panther agency, human panther relationships, and ideally also of relevant post-medieval developments. Self-evidently such an approach is potentially transferable also to other species, but self-evidently also it's a framework that is inherently fluid and malleable. Not least because, as I'm sure is already obvious, what I have here presented as separate approaches, you know, inquiring into actuality, allegory, agency, and anthropological divides, are in fact intrinsically interrelated. And I want to end here with a case in point, 
namely Rainer Maria Rilke's Der Panther. We won the whole gamut of genders. We had Das Panther, La Panther. In German, it's Der Panther, masculine. This is from 1902, 1903, and is almost, well, I was going to say almost certainly, is definitely the most distinguished literary work yet devoted to a panther. I think it needs to be read, so if you don't mind, I'll read it, <coughs> and you can follow either the original or the translation. Sein Blick ist vom Vorübergehen der Stäbe so müd geworden, dass er nichts mehr hält. Ihm ist, als ob es tausend Stäbe gäbe und hinter tausend Stäben keine Welt. Der weiche Gang geschmeidig starker Schritte der sich im allerkleinsten Kreise dreht, ist wie ein Tanz von Kraft um eine Mitte, in der betäubt ein großer Wille steht. Nur manchmal schiebt der Vorhang der Pupille sich lautlos auf. Dann geht ein Bild hinein, geht durch der Glieder angespannte Stille und hört im Herzen auf zu sein. On one level, that's obviously a poem about a real panther, one that resided in the zoo of the Jardin des Plantes in Paris while Rilke was there. Rilke doesn't tell us it's black, but it does offer several well-chosen phrases describing other aspects of the animal's appearance, its weary gaze, the smooth pace, the supple strength of its walk, the tensed stillness of its limbs. It's obvious enough that this animal really is a panther. It's not, though, an impersonal representative of the species, in a way that the panther of, say, Pliny or Albertus Magnus is. It's an individual animal, and it kind of has a certain kind of agency, at least within the relatively restrictive confines of its cage. It can do pretty much what it wants within those confines. Moreover, it's an animal that has a connection, indeed a relationship, with human beings most obviously with the poetic eye, with the poet himself. In many ways, indeed, poet and panther are mirror images of each other, aren't they? Just as the poet looks at the panther, so the panther looks at the poet. Most of the first and third stanzas, after all, describe the panther's gaze. And the gazes of human and panther are in many ways similar. Both look through iron bars, both receive images soundlessly through their pupils, and both are in a sense passive, in that their mutual gazing doesn't lead either of them to make any kind of physical move towards the other. Ultimately, though, the poet's identification with the panther goes still further than that, in that he enters in a very real way into the animal's consciousness, and is able as such to become its mouthpiece in a much more sophisticated way that Apollonius von Thurland was with his panther. The poet persuasively verbalizes the panther's weariness, emptiness, hopelessness, inability to process in its heart what it sees with its eyes. So much so indeed that you could argue that his own independent voice becomes lost and is merged with or subsumed under the inaudible but clearly perceptible voice of the panther. Finally also, to bring us around full circle, this panther too can be seen as an allegorical animal, albeit the subject of an, of an allegory which is far less verbal, far less explicit, far more open than anything we have met in a medieval context. But this panther too is eminently interpretable. It too can and potentially does represent many things beyond itself. It could represent anyone or anything suffering from imprisonment, for example, or loss or lack of freedom. Could represent the solitary self-absorption of the creative artist, Rilke at times referred to himself as a panther. Or indeed, it could represent, captive as it is, the baleful apparent triumph of culture over nature that preoccupied so many of Rilke's contemporaries. In the end, there are at least as many possible interpretations of this panther as there are readers of the poem. He could be seen as pretty much everything, with the possible exception of 
because I'm afraid I had to get him in somewhere pink. <laughs> As he would say, that's all folks. <laughs>